I thank the Lord for the opportunity to speak again to you this morning. I thank the Lord uh, for taking care of each one of us, bringing us here again safely. This morning I'd like to share with you on a topic that uh, should be of importance to all of us here. The Pope, the President and the Planet is the title. And this is a subject that involves every one of us, our eternal destiny. Our scripture reading in Revelation 14 verse 9 brought forth what is termed the greatest or most threatening warning ever addressed to mortals. Revelation 14 and verse 9. Here we have an angel depictured in heaven, flying in heaven, crying with a loud voice, saying, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, and verse 10 tells us, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Whatever it is that concerns God to the point where God is going to pour out his wrath unmixed with mercy, it must be a vital subject for us to understand. As Seventh-day Adventists, particularly as Reformers, we understand, uh, we should understand Bible prophecies. If we are a student of Bible prophecy, we'll understand some things. Now, to, for the sake of time, I'm not going to elaborate on all the images brought to view in this prophecy here. But I'll just uh, summarize. Firstly, the beast, according to Revelation uh, 13, the beast is who? Who is the beast of Bible prophecy? Who is the beast of Bible prophecy? We understand to be the, the papal system. Yes, the papal system. So here we have the beast is the papal system and brought to view here his image. His image. And we'll talk a little bit about his image today. But we understand that his image will be a power that is like, an, like the papal system. And the papal system was a religio-political power. It was the church united with the state throughout the dark ages of Europe. It was a church, in fact, ruling the state. The church would pass its laws and the state would enforce those laws. And whoever did not obey those laws were punished, either with fines, imprisonment, and many with death. That is the beast in its full uh, uh, development, in its, in its uh, un- uh, fettered uh, activity. And the prophecy brings to forth here, brings to our view, the fact that there will be an image formed to the beast. That is something that's like the beast, not the beast, but like the beast. And thus we are expecting a similar power, a religio-political power to arise once more that will result in the persecution of those who defy its, its laws. And God is telling us here that if anyone is going to worship that beast or its image or receive its mark, its mark, we'll talk about that a little bit today as well, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So we need to understand in regard to these things. I want to now just take you, bring you to some current events in regard to the papacy and its actions today. Now, by the way, well, what is the mark of the beast? Just very quickly, can you fill in the picture here for me? What is the mark of the beast? Now, the beast, if it's a papacy, the mark is what? What's the mark of the beast? Huh? It's a mark of its authority. And what is the mark of its authority? The fact that it did what? That it, yes, changed what? It, it professed to change the sanctity of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, from the seventh day to the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And it claims that that is its mark of ecclesiastical authority to do that. And all the churches who follow that, that uh, practice, that tradition, are in fact paying homage to the power that first introduced that as an act of worship. And that was the Roman Catholic Church. So everyone that, that is worshipping on the Sunday and traditionally is paying homage to that fact of history, paying homage to the papacy. So Sunday is the day that unites all of Christendom in this one, uh, under this one uh, banner of worshipping the beast. 
and his image is likewise. Now the, the mark, therefore, is the mark that he, of his authority, which is to change the Sabbath from Sunday to, uh, sort of rather from Saturday to Sunday, from the seventh day to the first day. Many years ago, about 20 odd years ago, I was asked by a young person, I was having a discussion with a young person right here actually in, in uh, this uh, conference, uh, and uh, they asked me the question, because they were struggling with how could all the world accept Sunday as a day of worship? Considering that you have not just Christians, but you have atheists, you have Muslims, you have uh, Hindus, you have Buddhists, you have all kinds of religions of the seven billion people, only about, I think about one and a half billion, nearly two billion would be professed Christians, the rest not professed Christians. So how would you, how would you um, take into that, under, uh, into, uh, bring all those people to the point where they will accept Sunday as the day of worship? In fact, what about the secular society of Australia and the USA where you have 24 hour shopping on Sundays in the USA? In some places, many places, in fact, 24 hours shopping on Sunday. You have sports on Sunday, entertainments on Sunday, all kinds of things on Sunday other than religious activities. In fact, religious activities is in the decline on Sunday in these nations, America, Australia, England. So then how can you bring in a Sunday law in these countries? In fact, in America in itself, if it is to be the image to the beast, Oh, that's a good question. Well, let me share with you. I sort of struggled with it myself at the time, but I know, look, the Bible prophecy says it would take place. Now, I shared with you about four years ago, in 2015, a, uh, some news that came from the Vatican in regard to an encyclical that the Pope issued. The encyclical was called uh, Laudato Si in 2015. And in that encyclical, the Pope put forth an appeal in regard to the protection of our common home the environment, in, view, in regard for our common home, the earth. And in that uh, uh, encyclical, he says this, there are certain environmental issues where it is not easy to achieve a broad consensus. But I am concerned to encourage an honest and open debate so that particular interests or ideologies will not prejudice the common good. He went on to say there, the urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development, for we know that things can change. So what was the Pope doing here? He wanted to bring, he's appealing that all of humanity should come together in a common effort and sustainable effort to protect our common home, this earth, regardless of your religious or... or uh, ideological persuasion. And it's very interesting that in that um, in same encyclical, the Pope appeals to humanity to consider Sunday as a, as a, as a uh, critical element in protecting the environment we live in. How does Sunday have anything to do with the environment? Well, what is Sunday? What is Sunday? Traditionally, what is Sunday? Hmm? Say again? Well, it, no, traditionally, in our society, traditionally, what is Sunday? No, 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 no. Traditionally, in secular society, what is, what is Sunday considered to be? Day of rest. Now, if you have to go and work on Sunday, what do employers have to do? Most companies, they will what? Play you what? Double time. Why? Because Sunday should be your day off. And if you have to work on Sunday, we'll pay you double time so you can work on Sunday. All right? So double time is paid so you work on Sunday. So, so the Pope says, all right, if we respect Sunday as a day of rest, that's going to be good for humanity. The church and society recognizes having, having a day off is good for your family environment. It's not just the physical, natural environment you see out there, but also your own human relations. The environment of the human relations. And thus, Sunday is instrumental in that. And what day... Uh, um, he also puts forth this idea of the Eucharist. And what is the Eucharist? The Eucharist is the celebration of the Mass, which is the body and blood of Christ, you know, uh, uh, consuming the body and blood of Christ in the Holy Mass, which is, takes place in the Catholic Church every Sunday. Now, this Eucharist 
we would call it the communion service, the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, it embraces and penetrates all creation. Thus, the Eucharist is also a source of light and motivation for our concerns for the environment, directing, directing us to be stewards of all creation. What's the Pope getting at here? He's saying this, who does the Eucharist represent? Who does the body and the blood represent? In the communion service, who does, what does the bread represent? The, the what? The body of Christ and the blood? The blood of Christ. So we have the body and the blood of Christ. We are celebrating the death of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. But who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? He is the Son of God. And what did Jesus do? Together with the Father in the beginning, what did they do? Huh? Help me here. What did they do? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1 verse 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. That is the Word, and not anything that was made that, was made that, that wasn't made by Him. Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. The Father created all things through Jesus. So when we celebrate the Eucharist, we're, we're coming together in worship of the Creator. And the Creator created what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Therefore, this earth belongs to who? God. There was a famous song when I was growing up as a teenager in the 80s. Uh, is the, this the world he created? What did he do it for? Is this the world we've devastated right to the core? If there's a God looking down, what would he think of what we've done to the world that he created? I remember the words of that song. And so the Pope is appealing to humanity to respect the earth that was created by God. And when do we do that? When we come together to celebrate the communion service, which in the Catholic Church every Sunday. And so, the, so, so, that, and so when, you, when you're celebrating, when you're worshipping the Creator, out of respect for the environment, out of respect for the common home, this earth, what day do we do that on? Sunday. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist, I'm reading again from this encyclical, Laudato Si, on Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. There you have it. Sunday is a day of healing, a healing of your relationship with God, with yourselves, with others, and with the world. Okay, so do you see what the Pope is doing here? Do you see what he's doing here? He's bringing in, in concerns for the environment in direct connection with, with the worship of sun, on Sunday. Do you see this? Sunday observance is, is going to be conducive to protecting our environment. Not just the physical, but also our own human relations. Restorating, a restoration of the family, of our societies, by respecting the environment, particularly as we remember it all on Sunday, that day of rest for the family and ourselves. So this is what the Pope is putting forth in his encyclical here. Now, Sunday, he goes on to say, is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose first fruit of the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. It also proclaims man's eternal rest in God. Now, is that true that Sunday proclaimed man's eternal rest in God? Which day, according to the Bible, is the day of rest? Which day is it? God calls the seventh day, the Sabbath, as my holy day. Isaiah 58, my holy day. Verse 13 and 14 calls it my holy day. Which is the only day that God has called his holy day? The seventh day Sabbath. That's the only day that is called his holy day. Therefore, that is the Lord's day. Saturday, not Sunday. Don't be deceived by this. In this way, he goes on to say, Christian spirituality incorporates value of relaxation and festivity. Okay, but this is what the Pope is calling for here. And so the day of rest centered on the Eucharist, which is the symbol of the Creator, 
sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for what? Greater concern for nature and the poor. This is the push the Catholic Church is making for the, the environmental, through the environmental concerns, the push for worshipping on Sunday, honouring Sunday. I go on uh, now to um, bring into play the world leaders, in particular the President of the United States. You know, on September 15, uh, so September 2015, Pope Francis has made a speech to the White House where he explicitly supported Barack Obama's plan to cut carbon emissions. Now, that plan, let me just, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to escape this for a minute because I want to bring some points out here which I can't do a um, extended screen here because of the way this setup is. I don't know why, but anyway, let me just uh, have to cut, it, cut these slides down a little bit so I can read my notes here. Okay. Uh, in Pope Francis' speech to the White House, he explicitly supported Barack Obama's uh, plan to cut carbon emissions and chastise climate change deniers for failing in their duty to protect our common home. So Pope Francis chastised people who were denying climate change. Now a key goal of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, which is what Barack Obama signed the United States up to, what was the Paris Climate Agreement that was uh, signed in 2015 by many of the world leaders. What does that have to do with the environment? Well, it's a global, it's a commitment to limit the global average temperature rise to well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees. And on September 3rd, 2016, Barack Obama signed this agreement on behalf of America. And that came into force on, into force on November, November the 4th, 2016. Okay, so that's what happened there in 2015. So the Pope uh, endorsed Barack Obama's signing of that agreement, signing America up to it. And he, he praised uh, Barack Obama, praised him for doing this. And he spoke to the uh, Congress at, in 2015 in regard to this. Now, furthermore, um, I want to share another... Uh, uh, idea here regard the climate and, and, and how it relates to Sunday. There is an economist by the name of uh, Men Dr. Menahem David Smadja. He is an economist, an author and a religious scholar. And you can look him up on, you can Google him. But on his website he puts forward a, forth a proposal uh, that may hold the answer of how can we cut global emissions? How can we achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement? Well, he is calling for, firstly, an international day of rest, 53 days per year. An international day of rest, 53 days a year. Now, how many weeks are there in a year? On average, about 50, but well, depending on, you know, there's a few more days each, every couple of years, there'll be 53 weeks. You know, 52 to 53 weeks in a year. 52 weeks is normal, but on average, roughly over a period of, because of the leap uh, year, the year doesn't exactly fit in with uh, uh, seven days times 52, doesn't exactly fit into 365, so roughly those about 53 days per year, plus an additional 15 days of holidays. Now we have about eight or ten holidays here, I think, in Australia, on top of our Sundays, a day off. Now these days together make about 70 days in a year. And Dr. Smudger says that these 70 days equate to about 20% of the year. Now let's imagine this. He is calling for individuals and industry to refrain from all creative manufacturing and productive activity on these days. To shut down industry, to shut down manufacturing, any productive activity and thus reduce carbon emissions. Can you imagine all the factories in the world were to shut down for 53 days, oh, sorry, sorry, for 70 days a year? That is 20% of the year. Straight away, in one year, you're reducing carbon emissions by 20%. Doesn't that sound interesting? Doesn't that sound like a plausible idea here. 
uh, to, to do this. Notice what he says, these 70 days, they represent about approximately 20% of the year, they would help to achieve the shared global outline in the Paris Climate Conference of a 20% reduction of pollution globally by 2050. Now, I've, I got this, by the way, from CEO World Magazine. CEO stands for Chief Executive Officer. This is a magazine marketed to business leaders, people in industry. And this, mate, this article was talking about a modest proposal for a day of rest. And he, they quote a number of uh, sources that, are calling, that, that uh, put forth good ideas of why it's beneficial for that to take place. And they quoted Dr. Smudger here in the magazine. And he says these 70 days represent approximately 20% of the year. Would it help achieve the shared global goal of 20% reduction? The impact of a day of rest not only would pr provide needed relief to our planet and ecosystem, it will also benefit people if individuals adopt a day away from technology, work and other pursuits. We will also see improved quality family time. So, you have, so on one hand, you have the Pope calling for a day of rest to be Sunday. On the other hand, you have economists here, quoted in, in, uh, in business magazines, calling also for a day of rest, all in view of protecting the environment. Not just the physical environment, but the environment of our humanity, of our, of our own human relationships, our families, ourselves. So this is, uh, this is not something that is unheard of. It's not something that is out of the ordinary to put forth these proposals. And I could just imagine uh, why, how would everyone would accept this is a good idea. Why? Look what he, uh, Dr. Smudger goes on to say here. This frantic race to go faster and faster makes us forget essential things such as loving ourselves, others and also our Earth. The result is a global disaster whose ecological impact is more and more obvious. A Sabbath for ourselves, our industry and our environment is a corrective to these failures. So the failures of the industrial age will be corrected by a Sabbath rest. It is a transcendence of spiritual over material, will lead to a better sharing of wealth and a measurable improvement to the climate crisis that can bring together populists, progressives, conservatives toward a common cause. Let me ask you a question. What is the greatest concern among voters age 18 to 25 in the Western world? The environment. Voters aged 18 to 25, their, most, their, their greatest concern is the environment. That's the, prop, that's the next generation. Who will this appeal to? That generation. That generation is, in, in, is a generation that, that uh, is used to time off. I know when I was in labour hire, we're, we're trying to get you know, 18 to 25 year olds on the job site and to stick to the job. <laughs> and uh, it's so hard to do that. In fact, as a recruitment agent, it would be unusual to see someone with, in a job for more than two years. 30 years ago, to be in a job for 30 years or 40 years was the norm. Today, you'd hard pressed to find, just find young people sticking to a job for more than two years. They just want to do what they desire to do. And if they want to have a day off, they'll have a day off. They're very flexible. In their, in their way they approach their work life. And if they think that, yeah, if Sunday's going to protect our environment, let's have a day off on Sunday. Now think about it. What would be more attractive to a politician if they raise that, if they put a climate uh, change tax, if they put a carbon tax on society, it trickles down to the bills that you receive for your electricity. And that means the voter is not happy. And so politicians don't like that idea. And if you shut down industry, then you, there go the jobs. That is, shut down coal mines and things like that. But what if you just simply said, let's just close the factory for one day a week? Would, there, would people say that was okay? Do you think people would think that was a good idea? Yeah. 
one day a week. And businesses would say, oh, all right, well, we can, we can shut for one day a week because that's going to be, you know, keeps, keeps their workforce happy. We'll do that. If everyone's on the equal playing field, let's do that. And politicians say, that's a good idea. It doesn't cost us any votes. So they're all will be in it together. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Do you understand what I'm saying here? So 20 years ago when I was asked, well, how can they bring in Sunday law into secular society? Think about it. Think about it. It's concern for the environment that will help bring this in. That's what we're seeing today. Now, in, a, in a, uh, an effort that, that ended up thwarting the plans of some, in 2017, President Trump cited economic reasons announced his intention to withdraw the USA from the Paris Agreement. That, would, that will take place November 4th next year. However, Congress was not happy about that. Because what happened? See, President Trump said, if the Paris Climate Agreement is going to destroy American industry, we're, on a, we're going to be on an unequal playing field with our competitors. I'm going to withdraw from it. But what did Congress do? Well, Congress on the 7th of May this year said, no, no, no. On the 7th of May this year, Congress passed a bill that requires the President to develop and update annually a plan for the United States to meet its nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And specifically, he must describe steps to cut greenhouse emissions and to confirm that he is keeping his targets and other parties are keeping their targets and furthermore, to spend no money to withdraw from that agreement early. In other words, Congress is saying, no, 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 we are sticking to that agreement and we're not going to let you withdraw from it you know, just as quickly as what you want to do. So the US Congress wants to push forward with the Paris Climate Agreement. It'll be interesting to see what happens next year, in November 4th. But these things, this is a battle that's waging right now. The Pope pushing for it. He's, he, in fact, only a few, uh, back in June, he declared a climate emergency in June. To energy leaders that met with him in the Vatican, he declared a climate emergency. And energy appealed to energy leaders to act now. To act now. And, and uh, what did he do just last month? Just last month, the Pope endorsed a global education alliance where he announced an initiative where he was hosting a global pact to create what's called a new humanism. He has set May 14, 2020, next year where he has invited representatives of the main religions, international organizations, and various humanitarian institutions, as well as key figures from the world of politics, economics, and academia, that is education, and prominent athletes, scientists, and social, sociologists to sign a global pact on education so as to hand on to Younger generations are united and fraternal common home. Basically, the Pope is appealing to all of the uh, educational leaders in the world, organizations, uh, key figures, sports figures, political figures, sociologists figures, to come together to sign this global education pact. Religious leaders as well, whether you're uh, Islam, Catholic or Jew no matter what, to all come together to sign this global, a global education pact to educate the next generation globally, to recognize we're all part of a global village, to unite all religions together with respect for everybody's religion under the one banner of, of protecting our common home. And again, which day does he want to set aside to protect that common home? Which day? Sunday. Sunday. This is happening, brothers, this is before our eyes. In fact, he, he quotes uh, from the letter. Uh, in, in this video, you can, go, you can, you can uh, just Google it. Pope Global Education. <laughs> Pope Global Education. And you'll go to the Vatican website. You can, you can watch his video there. It's only a four-minute long video, but he, he appeals there. And he references Laudato Si, where he appeals for people to protect our common home. So this is all happening before our eyes. 
And there he says this. Let me just say, share this. That uh, referencing, he says, in this kind of, he talks about uh, creating a global village. Hillary Clinton, he references her often used uh, quote where she says, uh, and we know what it, it takes a village to what? It takes a village to raise a, you heard that? It takes a village to raise a child. Not just the family, it takes a village to raise a child. Are you familiar with that expression? Yes or no? It takes a village to raise a child. In other words, as a family, you're trying to raise your child, but your child gets caught up with the neighbor's children next door, they go down the street and get involved in some activity which you don't know about, but guess what? Your neighbor down the street sees them there and, and rather than, you know, <laughs> and pulls them up and helps keep them out of trouble. Are you with me there? Put your hand up if you grew up in a village in Europe. Put your hand up if you grew up in a village in Europe. Do you understand what it means? It takes a village to raise a child? If you're in a little village, can you get away with everything? No? If your mum and dad didn't see you, who would see you? <laughs> Say again, the local? The local? All right, okay. Yeah, those people, everyone is looking out for everyone's kids. And the Pope wants the world to be like a global village. Everyone looking out for everybody. And nobody fighting anybody. And that's what he goes on to say here, that um, this village, he says, uh, this kind of village, an alliance must be forged between the earth's inhabitants and our common home, which we are bound to care for and respect, an alliance that generates peace, justice and hospitality among all peoples of the human family as well as dialogue between religions. Notice that, an alliance that generates peace. Peace. What does the Bible say? Particularly in regard to the Antichrist's power. For when they shall say what? Peace and safety. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Brothers and sisters, beloved, these things are happening as, we, as I speak. These things, these things are happening right around us. And we may be so caught up in the affairs of this world, in the cares of this life, that we don't even see these things happening as they're happening. Time is short. The Pope, the President and the planet, why should we be concerned? What does Bible prophecy have to say? We are familiar with the third angel's message, which says, If any man worship the beast in his image, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up, for, ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. This is our concern. Revelation 14 verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. So in view of that third angel's message, warning the world against receiving the mark of the beast, is brought to view a, a people, a company of people. It says here, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In contrast to the worshipping of the beast and receiving his mark in their foreheads. What is this receiving of the mark in his forehead? What is, this, what is this all about? Well, let me share Great Controversy, page 605. The question of enforcing Sunday observance. We read there, as the question is widely agitated and the event so long doubted and disbelieved is seen to be approaching, then the third message will produce an effect which it could not have had before. We may not see it widely agitated openly right now because we're not reading between the lines. But when you put it all together, when you see what the Pope is pushing for the environment, to care for the common home, he's already declared what day he wants to do that on. And you've got Jewish economists and scholars supporting a day of rest. Of course, the majority will say, well, let's do it on Sunday. 
Let's do it on Sunday. And people who so long doubted and disbelieved this event, as we see it approaching, what's, what effect will it have? An effect which it could not have had before. And I pray it will have that effect upon us today as we see this approaching. You know, Pope Francis says this, Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God and with ourselves, with others and with the world. Sunday is being promoted. And Barack Obama welcomed Pope Francis' encyclical and deeply admired the Pope's decision to make the case for action on global climate change. Barack Obama said, I believe the United States must be a leader in this effort. So the United States is going to be a leader in this effort. With the, and that will include Sunday. And, just, and, to, and to show you that Sunday is still relevant to European societies at least, in terms of its needful as a day of rest, in April of 2nd of 2018, Poland passed Sunday laws that, that uh, reduced the secularization of Sunday. According to Nicholas uh, Smith in the National Catholic Register, April 2, 2018, he writes this, that Sunday just, has just become a little less busy in Poland thanks to a new law banning most commercial shopping that took effect in March. And Poland's move, which bucks the prevailing trend in secularized countries toward an ever more commercialized Sunday, could provide a constructive example for the United States. What? The closing of the banning of most commercial shopping on Sunday could provide a constructive example for the United States, where the network of state blue laws that once restricted Sunday business activities has been substantially reduced. I remember one of our brethren in Melbourne were visiting a government uh, construction site that they were building. It was a police station. And they happened to go there on Sunday because they wanted to do some things in order to get ready for Monday morning. And they were on that site on Sunday. And a police car pulled up and, and interviewed them and said, what are you doing here on this site? It's Sunday. Oh, well, we're just here getting ready for tomorrow. No, 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 I'm sorry. You've got to get off this site. Why? It's Sunday. The law says you cannot be on the government site on Sunday. So they had to get off the site. And they're the contractor building the project. <laughs> And the police were enforcing what, in, what was in Victoria a blue law regarding Sunday observance. So these are, are ready to be re-rolled out. As soon as America has the will, power, the will to enact these laws against, like once again. So what are we waiting for? Are we waiting for the Sunday law? Are we waiting for the Sunday law? Are we waiting for the latter rain? What are we waiting for? What are you waiting for? Brothers and sisters, time is short. What does the Bible, what did God say was going to happen before this all would take place? Let's have a look. Come with me to Revelation 7 verse 1. The angel says, uh, John, John is seen here, after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now in Bible prophecy, for those students of Bible prophecy, you'll know that winds represents what? What does winds represent in Bible prophecy? Say again. Strife, yes. Yeah, strife, warfare, destruction. Political strife and warfare. So the four winds of heaven are, are, are about to be let loose. The angels of God are holding those winds back. That they should not hurt anything on this earth. Until when? Well, it says here, I saw in Revelation 7 verse 2, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the sea and the, the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till when? Till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. What are we waiting for? Sunday law? Latter rain? No. What are we waiting for? The seal of God in our foreheads. That's what we need, brothers and sisters. For when all God's people are sealed, then the winds will be let loose. Then destruction will come. 
As a woman in travail, destruction will come and, 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 and take away all. What does it mean to have the seal in our foreheads? Let me share a few thoughts on this. Isaiah 8 verse 16. The seal we find is spoken of here in relation to the law of God. Isaiah writes here, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my what? disciples. We know the law of God. The law of God is an expression of who he is. It's an expression of his character. The Ten Commandments are founded upon two principles. Love to God, to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Love to God with all your heart. It's a, it's a loving relationship with God. The principles of His law in our hearts and minds. That's what it means to have the seal of His law among us. It means that we're given our hearts over to Him and He has sealed us in our hearts with His laws. The principle of His laws. God is love. And that love is sealed in our hearts. Again, we read in Deuteronomy 6 verse 8, which is... If you start with verse 5 in Deuteronomy 6, it's here where God is appealing to the children of Israel to teach to their children and to their children's children His commandments, His statutes and His laws, all the words which He spoke unto the children of Israel. And if you read here, I just want you to come here, I don't have the slide, but just come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, because sometimes Christians, evangelical Christians, think that that Jesus, when he said, when, when the, he was asked by a lawyer, um, what is the first and greatest commandment? What did Jesus respond? What's the first and greatest commandment? What did Jesus respond? To love what? To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like unto it also, to love your neighbor as yourself. These were, upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So this was spoken of as the two greatest commandments. And many Christians believe that these were, this was the, you know, a revelation. The Jews did not understand this up until Jesus spoke these things. But what did Jesus say? Well, come back, me, come back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, because what Jesus spoke there is nothing new. In fact, that's why the scribe says you have well spoken. Because the scribe knew what was written. And what was written, come to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and verse 5. Verse 4 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt, what? I'm reading verse, six, uh, verse 5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Was Jesus speaking any new commandment? No, he was speaking an old commandment. And yet John, the beloved, says yet is a new commandment. Because for the Jews it was new because they failed to make God their own by faith. They failed to give their hearts fully to him. And thus they weren't serving him from love, but simply by merely from an obligation that if they did these things they would be saved. But, but Jesus appeals to, to the heart. And God was appealing to the heart there in Deuteronomy 6. And in view of that, he goes on to say, verse 6, so if you're loving God with all your heart, then verse 6, what are you going to do? You're going, These words shall be in your heart. The words I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them to your children, your children's children. Verse 7 and in verse 8, and you shall then do what? You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Now we know spiritually speaking, what's between our eyes? What, what's right there? behind there? Our what? Our mind, our conscience, right? That's where God seals his law. This relationship we have with him is sealed there in our hearts and minds, right there. And so, Song of Solomon 8 verse 6, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. The love is as strong as death. And he goes on to say, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the sustenance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned. God seals us with his love. That's what he does. So the law is sealed in our foreheads through a relationship with the law giver. And that is a relationship of love. And what is the sign or seal of this relationship? What's the sign or seal of it? Let me share 
Ephesians 4 verse 30 says this, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Who seals us? Who seals us? The Holy Spirit seals us. And what does the Holy Spirit do? In, this, in the testimonies, we read this wonderful statement, as wax takes the impression of the seal, so the soul is to take the impression of the seal of the image of Christ, sorry, of the character of Christ and retain the image of Christ. Wax, so the soul will take the impression of the seal of God and retain the image of Christ. The seal of God is the image of Christ. It's his character. As expressed in those Ten Commandments, law of love, God is love, the two commandments, two greatest commandments, filling our hearts with love, this is the seal of God where it's found in this sealing of the Holy Spirit, the character of Christ upon our lives, upon our hearts. That character will be manifest in you and I. How? Well, Ezekiel 36 verse 27 tells us what the Spirit of God will do. What will the Spirit of God do? Ezekiel 36 27 God says he, after saying that he would write his law in our hearts, he'll give us, take away the stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. He then says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Isn't that what God wants? For to have an obedient people? A people that love and that serve him from love? Brothers and sisters, that's what he does with his Holy Spirit. Comes into your life, into my life, to change us, to change our hearts, to take away the stony heart and give us that heart of flesh, a heart that loves him, that is obedient to him, not out of any mere a human uh, ideal, a human motivation, but simply because we love God. We love to do what's right. It's only those who have been born again to have that experience. Let's, let's, let me share with you on this. Uh, just, a, just a little further on this. God said this, that uh, a one, there's one commandment in which we find the seal of God. Explicitly. I'll put it to you explicitly. And that's in Exodus 28 to 11. This is the fourth commandment. What's the fourth commandment say? Well, there we have an appeal to keep the Sabbath day holy. What's the reason given? Well, the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? Who's it the Sabbath of? The Jews? No, it says it's the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's God's Sabbath. The Lord's Sabbath. Jehovah. Yahweh. That's his name. It's found there in this commandment. And again, what did he do? Verse 11, in six days God made, the Lord made heaven and earth to see and all that there is. He made everything in six days and he rested on the seventh. And so it, the Sabbath reminds us of God's title of creator. And thirdly, it reminds us of his territory. Who owns the universe? Who owns the universe? God owns it. God owns this universe. He created it for us. This world he created for us specifically. He is, so the Sabbath is the only one of those Ten Commandments that contains the name, the title, and the territory. The three elements that give authority to that document. When the President of the United States signs a document, he seals it with a great seal. And that seal contains his name, rather, rather his title and his territory, and he signs it with his name. And so we find in the Sabbath command the seal of God explicitly given here. So when you worship on the Sabbath... You're receiving God's seal. You're acknowledging that seal is this, uh, the, you know, the God that you're worshipping. God said in Ezekiel 20:20, 20, 20, Hello, my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I'm the Lord your God. Furthermore, he says, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I'm the Lord that sanctifies them. Now, my question is this. Are we able to keep the Sabbath holy? Are you able to keep the Sabbath holy? Are you? Of yourself? Yes or no? No. It's impossible. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? We're all unrighteous. We've all gone out of the way. There's none clean, no, not one. There's none that does righteousness. There's none good, no, not one. There's none that does righteousness. Job says we're all, we're, we're all unclean. 
How can we do? How can we keep the Sabbath holy then? We can stop work on that day, and the world can stop work on Sunday. But how can we keep the Sabbath holy? Well, look at this. Desire of Ages 283. In order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be what? You must be holy. How can you be holy? It tells us here, through faith, there's only one way. Through faith, they must become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. When the command was given to Israel, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the Lord said also to them, You shall be holy men unto me. Only thus could the Sabbath distinguish Israel as the worshippers of God. So when does God make us holy? We already read in Ezekiel 36, verse 25 and 26. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. God does that for us. When? When does he do that for us? When? When? Well, we can't obey God unless he changes us. We can't obey God. But when can we obey God? When? And when is that? When does that happen? Say again. Surrender, someone said. Someone's saying the word surrender. Yeah. Where does surrender take place, spiritually speaking, in our, you know, in our concepts here? Where does surrender take place? Where? When does it take place? Where? In the heart, yes, but in view of what? What knowledge comes to our mind? Huh? Okay, yeah, conversion baptism, you're right. But <laughs> what is it that God uses to draw all people to the place of surrender. He uses something to draw every man. Someone said once, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Who said those words? When was he lifted up? On Calvary, the cross. That's where all men will be drawn. And so we read this. Notice, let me share with you uh, from... Uh, Christ's Opera Lessons, page 63. Brothers and sisters, this is the experience that we must have if we are ever to hope to keep this Sabbath holy. As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. Holiness finds that it has nothing more to require. God himself is the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Where does the new heart take place? Where does God give us that new heart? At the cross. When we are on our knees, prostrated there at the cross, fully surrendered, recognizing that this sacrifice of Christ was because of you, because of me, personally, my sins, that's when I'm receiving, in a place to receive that new heart. And what happens? I become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And notice this, holiness finds that it has nothing more to require. Why? Because when God gives you a new heart, is it, is it, does he give you a, a, an unclean heart or a clean heart? What does he give you? David said in Psalm 51, Create in me a what? Clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's what takes place. It's a heart that loves to serve God. It's a heart where our desires, our purposes, our motives, are what we, we want to please Him. For it's God that works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. It says there in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. For it is, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is producing in you, the ISV says, producing in you both the, ability, the, the desire and the ability to do those things that please Him. That's the only way we can keep the Sabbath holy. And I want to appeal to you, if you have not yet given your heart to Jesus, brothers and sisters, we are on the verge of a stupendous crisis. 
I have more, but I know our time is gone. I'm sorry, our time is gone. I do have, I do have quite a few more slides, but I'll, let me just finish here because our time is gone. We are on the verge of a stupendous crisis, the greatest that this human race will ever be called to face. It's going to bring your soul face to face with death, eternal death, eternal destruction, because that's what's at stake here, eternal life or eternal death. That's at stake. We are either going to be called to worship the beast or respond to the call to worship the beast. And the whole world, Revelation 13 verse 8 says, the whole world wanders after the beast. The whole world whose names were not found written where? In the land's book of life. But those whose names are written in the land's book of life, what will Jesus do? Those whose names are written in the book of life, what will he do? Revelation 3 and verse 5. Revelation 3 and verse 5. I have it in the slides. Revelation 3 verse 5. I, I won't put it up on the screen here, but it's in my slides. Uh, Revelation 3 verse 5. He that overcomes, what? Will be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his holy angels. Do you want Jesus to confess your name today? Do you? Amen. We can have, we can, Jesus will confess that if we come to him today in full surrender of our hearts, whatever it is that's sin in our life, whatever sin that's, that's, that's keeping the full presence of God out of our, our, our life, the full um, workings of his spirit in our life, whatever it is, let us surrender that up to Jesus. Let him take away the idols from our lives that he can come in and fill us with his spirit, cleanse us, renew us, and push us forward to give this wonderful last message of mercy to the world, Jesus Christ and him crucified. May God bless and help us, brothers and sisters, today, while it is today, to make our calling and election sure. Amen.